you never dream with the smell. Your, what you hear or the flies when you're trying to have one meal <laughs> between 20 patients and 50 patients in the night. <laughs> you have uh, your food and you're full of flies. <laughs> This time on Eye on Yellow Fever, we take you inside some of the most challenging places on Earth to control an outbreak of disease. There were floods, hurricanes, earthquakes, epidemics, war. Inside of each one of this, there were all types of diseases, of which yellow fever is one of the big five. I'm talking, of course, about refugee camps, disaster areas, and similar humanitarian settings, sometimes disordered, makeshift and hastily put together with very few resources to accommodate those fleeing war or natural disaster. People live a very insecure life. They don't know if they have to leave. Maybe there are not the conditions to be able to access the health systems for whatever reason. So they are in a very, very, very vulnerable situation. The risk of outbreaks of the deadly disease yellow fever is both significant and growing. This is down to a cocktail of contributing factors, including climate change and increasing pressure on land, greater movement of people, particularly into cities, and a resurgence in a highly connected world of the mosquito species that carries and transmits the disease. Yellow fever may not be the most obvious global public health threat, but it's a disease with no cure and a growing risk that must be taken seriously. We are Eliminate Yellow Fever Epidemics, that's I for short. From the world's most senior public health experts to those on the front line of combating this deadly disease wherever it emerges, we have the inside story on yellow fever's expanding global risk. This is Eye on Yellow Fever. My name is Nika Alexander, and I'm part of the communications team at WHO in Geneva. The majority of places affected by recent outbreaks of yellow fever have been vulnerable, fragile, and conflict-affected. This makes any prevention and response efforts much more complex. This episode of Eye on Yellow Fever explores the challenging reality of those places, and I'm pleased to say I'm joined by not one, but two preeminent doctors, both of whom have vast experience and insight into handling disease in humanitarian settings. Okay, so my name is Jorge Castilla. I currently work in the World Health Organization. I am the lead of a team that deals with humanitarian interventions in fragile, conflict-affecting settings, such as people affected by the conflict, displaced populations, refugees, and so on. While Dr. Castilla is part of our WHO team, we also hear in this episode from one of our partners, a globally respected name in humanitarian response, Médecins Sans Frontières, or MSF. My name is Daniela Garone. I am a, an infection diseases doctor from Argentina, working with MSF for the past 13 years. Currently, I'm uh, working as international medical coordinator Everyone is knowing me as Dr. Daniela, so I suggest you call me like that. <laughs> no formalities. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Daniela. Is there such a thing as a typical humanitarian setting? Is there something you expect when you're going into a humanitarian setting? Is there something that you already, you know you're preparing for, that you expect to see in your role as a, as a medical coordinator? The first is that no one <laughs> chooses to be a refugee <laughs> or to live in such unnatural settings like refugee camps. Nobody is choosing that. That's your start point. You know that your population distress is already high. And especially when in refugee camps, when they are displaced populations, they are... Uh, moving because they need, because they are looking for uh, fleeing from uh, insecurity, from uh, persecution, from hunger. And that decision is a heartbreaking decision. I would say that there is a lot of ingenuity. They, they make solutions, but certainly the first moments, the first three months are so difficult. Just imagine yourself, you leave your house, 
and you go to another place where people speak another language, just imagine it and how difficult it would be. So yeah, they live very dire situations, but they develop also an incredible resilience. So you already are vulnerable <laughs> to everything, vulnerable to many of the circumstances that happen in a refugee camp or, or in a, a informal settlement. When you work in a, in a refugee or, or in, in informal settlements of a population that flee or, or move it, all that circumstances, you are always hundred steps behind, behind to provide safe water, behind all the needs of the population, not only in the health and the needs, but education, psychological support, access to organized systems. You're always, always 100 or more steps behind. And when you feel like, oh, well, now we are getting more organized and we are getting ahead of the needs, something happened. More people are coming in, insecurity happening, an outbreak happened that make you go back again to worsen. So it's very unstable situations. Healthcare can be made much more complex by factors like overcrowding, malnutrition, poor access to water, infrastructure, and sanitation. Add in people traveling from a range of places, likely without paperwork, such as their vaccination records. They perhaps don't speak the local language or understand their rights or legal situation in the host country. It is without a doubt a challenging and unpredictable set of circumstances. I want to mention the recurrent epidemics those that are the most common causes of death, which are respiratory infection, usually by pneumonia, by pneumococcus. There is diarrhea, frequently with rotavirus, malaria, of course. And then there will be tuberculosis in low resource settings. There will be trauma. The load of recurrent epidemics is really, really, really high. I've worked with MSF, uh, I work with WHO, and I've worked with MSF and other colleagues in different settings. And absolutely, MSF is is seen as being very nimble, very fast, very brave, ready to go in, in any circumstance. And in other places, I've also seen MSF was already there. You show up and MSF had been there for many years already. So I think that's a side of MSF's work that people might not realize, that you're not just suddenly showing up when there's a crisis. You, there are also places in which you are installed long-term, providing healthcare long-term to people. Yeah, so I work in Zimbabwe and Malawi for over 40 years, each country, and Mozambique and South Africa and Sudan. So in Zimbabwe, 2008, you remember very well the emergency of cholera. It's one of the biggest cholera response we ever had. We started and escalated so fast from a mission response in the country to an emergency teams from the five sections coming in response to the outbreak. You were saying how important the relationship with the community is and how important the community trusts that your decisions are in their best interest. How do you build that trust over a long term? What do you do to work on building that trust? You build a trust with the community by involving them, <laughs> they are a part of the response. They are part of the preparers. They are part of the programs. When we stop treating them as the beneficiaries and, uh, and we treat them as a, a stakeholder, they become involved. And when the community is becoming involved, they become accountable. Communities in many places, they do have an instructor. <laughs> They do have a structure of, of decision making for managing all the problems happening at community level, not only health. So we need to use this structure to involve them or to give the tools that they need and to listen their voice into the response. And that is not only creating a more effective response, but a more sustainable response. It's not something you do to be to be nice. It's actually, it needs to be done to be effective. No, it's a must. <laughs> good community relations usually mean good lines of communication. That, in turn, can mean a speedy alert to the presence of disease. And Dr. Castilla says that can be crucial. One of the biggest obstacles is early diagnosis. You need to know 
that something happened. If a group of people have died for an explained and unknown disease, but you know they had fever, from that moment till you are able to investigate and describe, you are able to obtain samples to ship them through an airplane or a boat or a bicycle to a laboratory to be able to do a differential diagnosis of the many causes and to find it, you might have already had in the place where the surveillance system was not so fast, many chains of transmission. So maybe one person has transmitted to two, to four, to eight, to 16. And when you finally confirm the diagnosis, there are many cases and it's much more difficult to reverse. It's really an understanding of the context and the risks, of course. Let's step a, a little bit towards a moment when you're called to respond. So when you hear a signal of an infectious disease, whatever infectious disease, be it yellow fever or another disease, you know, the first few cases when the people with the symptoms are coming back, maybe there's some sudden deaths, whether or not they know what it is. What's the information you want at that point? What are the questions you're asking the colleagues so that you can better understand how this might develop? The first is to make sure you have access to care and treatment to reduce morbid mortality. And the second is to identify the source of the outbreak, whether it's in a waterborne outbreak, you will need to identify the water. You put all the measures to access to safe water and sanitation, like in case of cholera, in case of typhoid. You will isolate the contact immediately, depending on which disease is you are treating, no? And then you trigger all the response mechanism and control mechanism, including the access to vaccination for outbreak control. That outbreak response could be installing fixed or mobile vaccination teams or community volunteers to raise awareness of disease symptoms. In April 2021, the I strategy supported a yellow fever campaign in Sudan reaching 100,000 Ethiopian refugees. And as Dr. Daniela says, each humanitarian setting faces its own challenges. So th this is for me the key thing is how your health staff is aware of, oh, this fever is not just simple fever. This is a fever that could be a yellow fever, or this is a cholera case, or, or a meningitis case. What they should do, yeah, and that will depend on the endemicity of the diseases in different settings, and it will depend on the prevention campaigns that exist in that setting, uh, if you have a high coverage of measles uh, in a camp, which is difficult, then measles uh, outbreaks are a risk, but you monitor your uh, vaccination coverage. Could be, I need to think measles, but maybe I need to think something else, you know. So knowing your population, and having a good case identification and awareness, and then trigger the response is to key uh, crucial actions. It's also vital to understand what diseases a population is potentially at risk of and why. Let's say you're in Ethiopia and the higher you are, the less the density of mosquitoes. So let's say you live in the highlands and there is no malaria and because there is no malaria, there is no immunity to malaria. And let's say that because of a conflict, they need to move and they move to the lowlands where there is a high incidence to malaria. They are not going to be in the same conditions as the populations that have always lived there and that were born. And if they are alive, it's probably because they have already survived uh, malaria attacks. The new population are going to be very, 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 very susceptible to, to malaria. And that's true of any mosquito-borne disease, including, of course, yellow fever. So far, so complex, fragile and challenging. Our thanks to Dr. Jorge Castilla, the World Health Organization's Senior Coordinator for Health Emergency Response, and to Dr. Daniela Garoni, International Medical Coordinator for Médecins Sans Frontières. <laughs> Episode 4 of Eye on Yellow Fever was devoted to public health in the climate crisis. Go back to find it in your podcast feed. But for the last part of this episode, our expert guests are still with us as we focus on how humanitarian settings in particular are affected by the two big C's, 
COVID-19, and climate change. For epidemics and for climate change, we need solidarity, and this solidarity is not a matter of charity. It's a matter of self-interest. With the increasing outbreaks and uh, disasters uh, related to climate change and uh, planetary health, that will need us to become smarter, humble, and collaborative. This is episode eight of Eye on Yellow Fever, a 10-part series from our iTeam and partnership. To learn more about us and our objectives, see the link in the show notes for this episode in your podcast player, or just search online for Eliminate Yellow Fever Epidemics. And as with all podcasts, if you want to get episodes of Eye on Yellow Fever automatically downloaded to your phone or device, just click subscribe or follow. There are seven episodes already in the feed ahead of this one. If you've just found us, we would love for you to go back and listen right from episode one. But now, back to disease response in humanitarian settings with Dr. Daniela Garone. What has been the impact of COVID on your responses, either directly or indirectly? How have you felt? How has MSF felt the impact of COVID? Oh, and there are many, many things to say here. COVID, the pandemic, has caused catastrophic challenges. I and mean, in the health staff, health staff are not broadly available in situations where we are working. And therefore, caring about them as a healthcare provider is, is, is becoming critical. Helping them to prevent getting infected, getting uh, sick or die. And the second is to make sure that their well-being uh, from a mental health support is there. And these two things were very challenged under COVID. They were coming back to their home and many of their families got infected and um, or many of health staff were having the pressure of coming back to their houses, or they were seeing a lot of patients dying one after the other under an extreme pressure without being able to offer care because care was not known, but also supplies were not available. So many PPE were not available. So even knowing how to protect themselves, they were not able to do that. So it was a very difficult situation. It created some extreme stress at all settings. What we saw is that many things like the regular vaccination against yellow fever and others have decreased by 30% in many cases because of COVID. Not only the fear, but also the logistic troubles given by the disruption of supply chains and transport and so on. Dr. Castilla also says he's worried about the impact of vaccine inequity. What may happen as a result of wealthy countries not doing more to support vaccination efforts in low-income countries? I think that the current state of the COVID pandemic is not necessarily a good sign because, as you have seen, the treatments, the prevention measures, the vaccine that have been produced up to now has gone in majority to, to rich places, right? So the message that is being told is whatever happens, we will be served first and you will be served afterwards. So you will have to find your way out. And people are, are receiving that message, right? At the same time, I hope that people will understand that if you don't take care of the rest of the world in something that is global, it's going to backfire to you. If there is a new strain of COVID that is resistant to the vaccine. I'm not saying that there is, but if there was, it will turn to places that had all the vaccination because it was able to, to thrive in a places that was totally unprotected. Like many of us, Dr. Castilla would dearly love to see more COVID-19 vaccines get to poor places around the world, particularly to the sorts of humanitarian settings where he and Dr. Daniela work. If and when that does happen, he predicts that lessons learned from past yellow fever vaccination programs will be vital to a successful rollout. Vaccines have not been available for poorer countries and for humanitarian settings. So they are going to go 
in an increasing way to more fragile and poorer and conflict-affected settings. But then the question is, once the vaccine is there, how do you ensure that there is a capacity to use it so they don't expire because just the, the planning to vaccinate was not there? And this is where yellow fever and polio come. You can see yellow fever, polio, measles vaccination as experiences on how to manage something like a COVID vaccination for a mass. Yeah? And probably, probably we will be able to negotiate access to places that were not accessible before because there is an imperative for everybody to be able to control and mitigate this disease. So I think we are going to use the lessons of the multiple approaches to yellow fever, either in, in campaigns, but also on regular vaccination and so on. So there is a lot to learn from yellow fever. So we've talked about the impact of COVID, and you also mentioned climate change. What impact will climate change have on your work? What impact is climate change going to have on increasing diseases or the difficulties to respond in, in some of these camps or other humanitarian settings? I would say we started to see much more uh, climate events related. A good example is the cyclone in Mozambique. So there were at least three cyclones in the last year and a half with the devastating effect in the society and the population with a lot of disruption of services. People could not go to anywhere. So then all chronic diseases were not continuing. Eh? So we are talking about an area of high HIV, TB prevalence. So there were a lot of disruptions in chronic medication, including the TB and HIV, it was a lot of damage. At least four primary health clinics in, in Beta were completely destroyed. So then where are you going to provide care? <laughs> you don't have care. You don't have medications coming. You don't have, you destroy medications that now is floating. You lost all the record of patients. So what, what, how you continue care on these situations? I fear we are going to have increasing risks because as the planet gets hotter, probably all those diseases that are viral and that are vectored by insects, they are going to increase. And happily, in the world where I live, you really work to mitigate the worst. So it's not a world where you can show how much things have changed for the best. You really try to hold the worst from happening and support populations in very difficult circumstances. It's difficult to prevent these events to happen. And whatever action you do in climate change, prevention of damage, it will take time. So the only solution is to get prepared. <laughs> to get prepared and to make sure that those populations who are prone for emergencies or outbreaks are vaccinated. <laughs> so you do more prevention of the impact of these disasters. The fact is that these type of problems are difficult to solve because the solution is not local. So it doesn't matter what you do locally. If there is not a global action, you will not be able to solve it. So for epidemics and for climate change, we need solidarity. And this solidarity is not a matter of charity. It's a matter of self-interest. Not a particularly upbeat way to end this episode, I'm afraid, but good to make that point so clearly. There are big challenges ahead. Huge thanks to our two incredibly knowledgeable and experienced guests for this episode, the WHO's Dr. Jorge Castilla and Dr. Daniela Garone from Médecins Sans Frontières. Word of mouth is so important when it comes to reaching new audiences with podcasts. So please, if you can, think of someone you know who'd be interested in the Eye on Yellow Fever podcast and send the link to them. You can also select subscribe or follow to make sure that all future episodes of Eye on Yellow Fever are automatically downloaded directly to your device. This episode was produced by Dave Howard with research from Amelia Janssen and sound design by Adam Whaley. I'm Nika Alexander. 
Eye on Yellow Fever is a Bengal Media production for Eliminate Yellow Fever Epidemics.